Mitch Cleary here. We're back in Peterborough. Honored to be here with Paul Dietrich today. Paul is one of the largest land developer home builders in Peterborough. I've been building in the city of Peterborough now for 35 years. This here is a 130 acre farm that I had my eye on 35 years ago when I first started building in Peterborough. It has taken that long for us to get shovels in the ground due to all of the regulatory processes that we need to go through as far as red tape regulation after regulation after regulation. There is a need for one million new homes to be built in the province of Ontario over the next 10 years. We do currently have a significant supply issue with the current um, approval process. We're not able to get our development applications approved quickly enough. That is compounding the issues that we have, the housing crisis that we have, and that is why the price and cost of housing just continues to do this. How are you guys? Mitch Cleary here. We're back in Peterborough. We're honored to have the Matt McKeever video crew here and we're also honored to be here with Paul Dietrich today. Paul is one of the largest land developer home builders in Peterborough. We're lucky to have him. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things Peterborough construction, development, planning, and really just a wealth of insight about what has happened in Peterborough's past, where we are up to this point, and what the future is going to bring. So I have a lot of conversations with Paul about what's going on, and I would like to just share some of that knowledge here with you guys today. And we're standing at the new, well, we're at a, a beautiful vantage point. We're overlooking the city of Peterborough. We're in the north, sort of west end here, and we're at the new Trails of Lily Lake subdivision, which is essentially, as Paul puts it, the center of the universe for new construction at this point in time. And for the foreseeable future in Peterborough. So Paul's got a beautiful site on the go here, building some really nice uh, single family detached high end, 2,700 square foot uh, family oriented stuff that's pretty unique, high end construction techniques. And we're gonna have a bit of a conversation today just about what's going on in Peterborough, trends that Paul and myself are seeing and hopefully share some insights with you guys about Peterborough for those who aren't familiar with what's happening here. So Paul, welcome. Pleasure to be here, Mitch. Thanks for those comments and uh, excellent comments. Thank you very much. I am Paul Dietrich, owner of Dietrich Homes. I've been building in the city of Peterborough now for 35 years. In fact, I did home building uh, many years ago in similar communities such as we are here now at Trails of Lily Lake mm -hmm. with uh, Pat Cleary of Cleary Homes, which is a, <laughs> a, a, a competitor, good friend, colleague of mine today. So it's all, it's all good. Uh, this here is a 130 acre farm that I had my eye on 35 years ago when I first started building in Peterborough. It has taken that long for us to get shovels in the ground due to all of the regulatory processes that we need to go through as far as red tape regulation after regulation after regulation. One more signature, one more signature, one more signature, one more report, one more report, one more consultant. Finally, we have boots on the ground and we're here building homes today for people that are in need of housing. This particular housing development is a slightly larger housing development as Mitch has mentioned, predominantly 27 700 square foot homes, mm -hmm. family centric, mm -hmm. double car garage, four bedrooms, three plus bathrooms, uh, open concept living room, dining room, kitchen, e eating area, and it is finally happened. This has been 35 years in the making. We have had to go through many, many, many reports and consultants in order to get to this stage, and it's great to see and hear hammers <laughs> hammering away, <laughs> yeah. trucks rolling in, and more importantly, people working. That's jobs, economic growth, and prosperity for the city of Peterborough. Absolutely, yeah. It's a it's a great offshoot point. The fact that this was a concept in yours and a couple other people's minds, like you said, as as far back as 35 years ago. Because that points to we have a lot of conversations um, currently, and everyone is about the housing crisis, the housing solutions, and it dovetails nicely with the the sort of a, a rec the recent election and and the the, the government's mandates, uh, you know, to to 
build and repair 1.4 million homes over the next four years. I'm curious to know from your perspective as a city of Peterborough and as a province, what do you think the likelihood of that happening is and what do you see as the the hurdles or the, the ways forward, the solutions? Definitely, Mitch, if there is a will and a desire to accomplish that, it can happen. In fact, yesterday I was reading a report titled Baby Needs a New Home, and I believe it was um, commissioned uh, for the province of Ontario, and it dictates and spells out specifically that there is a need for one million new homes to be built in the province of Ontario over the next 10 years. That's 100,000 households to be created in the province of Ontario for 100 new households that are going to be created by immigration and also by the local population that's already here. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, um, I read a good Scotiabank report uh, a while back and it stated that basically just to be on par with, with the, the, the other our, our fellow G7 countries in terms of the uh, ratio of homes to populace, we actually need currently, like in this exact time frame, uh, 1.8 million new homes, and I don't believe that that factors in our ongoing uh, immigration rates and potentially our immigration acceleration. So it's it's needless to say, even though those might sound like big numbers, a million, that's a lot of homes. It's a lot of homes compared to what we've been used to building as a province and a country, but it's it's not really a lot in, in the scale of what we actually need. And um, I'm very interested to, to see if we're gonna be able to pull it off, because the people, people really need us to, to to figure it out right as a as a a, a group of the builders the municipalities um, everybody's got a stake in the game here because the markets at this point unfortunately barring some major credit collapse it, it's continuing to accelerate um, so let's talk Paul about what are you seeing in terms of trends and in, in terms of who who's showing an interest in these homes in in your sites at some points maybe it's investors it's it's local residents it's people from the GTA any shift in the just the demographics of who you're dealing with boots on the ground uh, right now Mitch we have a mix of local buyers buying in this particular community that live and work here in Peterborough mm -hmm. and then also we have migration from Toronto GTA greater golden horseshoe coming to Peterborough as well and we say here in Peterborough Peterborough's moving closer to Toronto mm -hmm. and I think that's predominantly because of the 407 connection mm -hmm. at the 115 highway interchange so that's fantastic that's good news for Peterborough however we do currently have a significant supply issue with the current um, approval process we're not able to get our development applications approved quickly enough mm -hmm. for us to have again like this boots on the ground shovels in the ground carpenters on hammers and just to see trucks of concrete coming in and building and um, accommodating and providing new homes for new households that are being created as we speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On the topic of approval and the approval processes, just the speed of the processes, there's, there's obviously people point to several um, consistent trends across municipalities that are, that are creating the bottlenecks and two, two that always pop up is, is nimbyism, not in my backyard, people who are um, sort of talking pro housing on the federal level and big picture they, they, they bring out the pitchforks when it comes to approving new development anywhere near their own actual neighborhood, their own home, so there's, it's literally the, the residents themselves sometimes are, are, are shooting down these potential developments and, and density projects um, but also, I hear on the municipal side, like that, uh, inter, you know, w within the 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 really where the rubber meets the road on these approvals is that people are the the, the municipality is feeling constrained in terms of being able to attract and retain talent, um, budgets for employees, um, and and really just having the 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 firepower to, to crunch through these sort of time intensive approvals. What do you see as the answer going forward to like just speeding up? Up the approval process. I think what we have done recently in regards to secondary suites mm -hmm. being prescribed by the province to the municipalities. In fact, I had a discussion regarding this with one of our mayors here locally just yesterday that uh, perhaps in order to achieve the numbers mm -hmm. that the province is pretty much dictating to the mm -hmm. municipalities that mm -hmm. they need to create, that they also give the municipalities tools. 
tools in their toolbox to use to say we are being prescribed mm -hmm. by the province. Not only we want to build this many housing units, we are going to build this many housing units and there will be literally a scorecard on a yearly basis mm -hmm. that are we achieving the yield and the builds that we should be because if we're not, we're going to need to do something about it right away. And then what's the call either A consequence or B incentive to meet the the criteria? Is there any discussion there? Because I always thought it'd be great and we we talked about this how if you could if you could somehow incentivize it where there's infrastructure grants that are related to X amount of units that are you know shovel ready per quarter or per year, that'd be great. But if they're just gonna try and mandate it and say these are the rules, these are the rules, um, I mean it's, we know from so many different examples that you know the right right down to coaching and how you get your children to to to, to participate and 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 do something willingly right up to every level of the workplace organization on to municipalities I think incentives are stronger than 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 the iron fist and I don't know like what do you see as that like how, how do they actually do it how do they get them to meet these mandates other than just saying do it and then if they don't meet their goals oops uh, well, you know what's the definitely Mitch tying in incentives or infrastructure funding mm -hmm. to a perhaps a, a municipality scorecard mm -hmm. that is monitored on a yearly basis where you are monitoring your yield and your builds mm -hmm. over a year over year basis mm -hmm. and the better you do the, the, the more um, qualified you become for infrastructure dollars or grants and that would go into streets and community parks and fitness centers and recreational facilities and walking trails. I think to me that seems like the real answer in the end because how else do you get residents uh, of particular municipalities that are worried about their own property values being dropped by mid-density developments near single-family detached uh, and, and sort of tra extra traffic on the streets, extra residents in their parks. How do you, how do you get them to approve it short of offering something in return, the give and the take, right? Like the, the give and get. So absolutely, I hope we see that, that you know, with, with each a project here, money for the city, you know, you can run the fountain more than this many days a year if you want, instead of worrying about the electrical bill. And then if you want, you know, you want the bigger canoe museum or uh, this park and skating rink there, I think that that seems to me to be the, the way forward. So hopefully, hopefully if anybody's watching that has any stake in the game, <laughs> those ideas, I'm sure they're definitely not new ideas, but it certainly seems like the, the way forward. Okay, so projecting into the future, Paul, what do you see, generally speaking, or any input you want to add about what do the next 10 or 20 years bring for Peterborough? For Peterborough, I see significant growth. I also see price appreciation with the, uh, again, with the supply chain issues that we have, the uh, development, uh, lack of development approvals that we're experiencing. We have a significant bottleneck of building product that we can actually build. And we still have the demand. The demand is still there. However, we are not able to su supply the product to the demand. And speaking of a seasoned builder of 35 years plus, not more than 20 years ago, I I was building homes just around the corner, just around the corner for $77,000. Yep. And now I could not even buy one of these building lots that we see here today for that price. So we are looking at a tenfold increase of housing prices that, is, that we've experienced in the last 20 some odd years. And incomes have not done the same, to say the least. No, they have not. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's something we talked about recently in terms of uh, just to backtrack it a bit in another conversation we had, Paul, about the, I believe, was it the Tower Hill? homes we were basically ballparking it there was roughly like three years income was somebody's uh, purchase price on a home back then you know th three to four years whereas nowadays when when the average price uh, is over six hundred thousand in the city and for the family uh, it's it's closer to what we're talking about here for the for, for uh, you know two three child family they're 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 having a hard time cracking into something that they want that's of the scale that they want for under three quarters of a million and and the, the the median household incomes in Peterborough um, are are you know hovering in the sixty thousand dollar range, and that's so so that's that's a household income. So you got the average person making closer to thirty thousand dollars, right? So so in terms of the amount of years of salary or of pay it's taking to enter the housing market now, it's so much further spread as a ratio. Am I right in terms of what it was historically or back when you were building those yes, homes? It is significantly, significantly. So the purchasing power of 
the dollar today needs to be stretched even further. Mm -hmm. And buyers are having to take out mortgages that are for a longer period of time and for more and for more money as well. Mm -hmm. So Paul, one thing we talked about before we started rolling and I'd love to revisit it is just the lineage, the progression. How did we get here as a as a province in a city with such a constricted reply, uh, supply of the housing crisis? Um, because you got a lot of insights in your, your history as a builder here. Um, anything that you care to share about what you've seen change over time and, and just take it back quickly to the start and what you've seen change from your time as a builder in the city? Well, I know that when I first started building in the city of Peterborough Mitch, back then there was 45 builders that I was competing against. And I was competing against those builders not only to buy service building lots, but also for trades and materials and supervision of the construction site. So that was, that was pretty significant back then. But yet getting into the industry at that time, definitely your learning car, your learning curve is accelerated even more so with that kind of competition. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, as the land supply and the approval process and red tape and regulation just got piled on and piled on and piled on, only those developers and business owners that truly knew how to navigate mm -hmm. those regulatory processes were able to still continue on and mm -hmm. provide housing service building lots mm -hmm. for builders. And then that pool of uh, competition starts to decrease and decrease and decrease. It's an interesting point it gives me a thought right away because then the criteria for who prevails as a builder in the market uh, you know as a capitalist market setup it's not necessarily who provides the best construction uh, and, and receives the best reviews on a case by on a build by build basis it's really who can survive and navigate the complications involved with getting projects ready which is it's interesting and it's obviously it shouldn't be that way right because then uh, I'm sure that it would allow those those that prevail to be less competitive in the end it's just as an industry and as a structure where you see obviously like the telecom giants um, the, the, you can sort of uh, the competition gets dampened because there's less there's more barriers to entry and then at the end of the day there's not as much incentive to continually improve your product right whereas obviously at this point now I know what you're doing here is you are pushing the envelope but am I right am I wrong that because of that constriction it's just very it's a very negative effect I think for the general market of buyers if like more people being able to enter the market would probably be good correct yeah generally sure. speaking yeah for sure, for sure yeah so right now the market is maybe four to five builders and those and those builders have had to become developers in their own right too or at least partner up with somebody that knows the development process so they can keep that supply chain yeah. of service building lots yeah. coming to them so they can continue on with boots on the ground tools in workers hands and those workers building homes now not standing around waiting for an approval process yeah. or somebody to sign off on a document just give me the building permit we can go to work we can build a home for somebody and we can keep ourselves employed and put a paycheck on the table at the end of the week yeah yeah I take my hat off to you guys that are still doing it because it's <laughs> it's complicated and it's hard work the persistence is incredible to get one of these projects off actually off the ground so um, I guess parting thoughts Paul just for fun because I have you know I'm sure we both take great humor in it and any any uh, anecdotes you could share about you know the building construction the history over time because obviously I've had a lot of fun conversations with you conversations with my father about the past history the camaraderie and the rivals between builders any fun stories about building history in Peter on the on the lighter notes well I do remember one day back in 94 Pat Cleary of Cleary Homes <laughs> your father we were building side by side in the same community he's on one side of the street I'm on the other side of the street I happened to go back to my office to pick up some paperwork to come back to the construction site when I got back, every single worker that was on the construction site, including my own, was wearing a yellow t-shirt with Cleary Homes branded <laughs> across the front, Cleary Homes branded across the back, Even on my houses that I'm building, so when prospects or home buyers oh, came yeah, through, yeah. they thought the entire community was being built up by Cleary Homes. So how did he... And that was your father, so, Pat. That's so funny. <laughs> Do those guys just need a t-shirt that bad, or how did he get your guys to... <laughs> oh, good fun. Yeah, that's good so fun. funny. That's 
it's competitive awesome. rivalry at the same time. 100%. Yeah. I know you guys learn a lot of each other off the years, so that's good. It's valuable. And those, really, the builder alliances are a key core to the builder's voice about the issues that they face in terms of people say, well, why don't the builders just build more? And the answer is very nuanced. And, and, and like it's the cooperation, the camaraderie of the builders together and, and joint voice to pass on their message to the government of what the issues are. And so it's a beautiful thing that everybody's all, you know, that we're here today doing this and that uh, the builders are as tight knit as they are. And you have such good relationships as you do with the builders that are down here. So mm -hmm. very much so, very much so, very much so. In fact, just last week at our local HBA Home Builder Association meeting, we were speaking of a colleague that passed away after many, many, many years of building in the city of Peterborough by the name of David Mitchell. And a good mm -hmm. colleague of mine, Garnett, had the minutes from a meeting that they had attended as an HBA Home Builder Association back in 1961. 1961, before I was even born. Yeah. And the minutes yeah. of the meeting were speaking to supply chain issues, skilled labor shortages. Uh, yeah, and yep, here we yep, are, yep. 40, 60, 60 years later, and the same issues are here today, but however, they're even more compounded mm -hmm. by the fact that we have such a significant shortage of development land that we can build on today. So that is compounding the issues that we have, the housing crisis that we have, and that is why the price and cost of housing just continue continues to do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah, not new issues. We're not reinventing the wheel with any of these problems we're trying to solve. It's just that uh, age old, we have not been able to overcome the, the same hurdles, I suppose, with the with the development land approvals. And we're in the most liquid market ever in terms of people's access to credit. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, we're in a big problem. And um, I, it's, you know, here we are, we're trying to navigate through it. So those were some great insights. Thank you, Paul, Go for ahead, taking nice. the time. Pleasure, Pleasure to be here. Hopefully that was helpful to everyone and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next video.